This episode of Innovate Fort Worth is powered by PNC Bank. Entrepreneurs are organic in many respects. Sometimes they don't think about, oh, I'm going to start a company. I'm going to start something. It's, it's like, I have an idea. How does that idea germinate? Where do I go for help and support? And by the way, if your community, say Fort Worth, doesn't help me, I'm going to go somewhere else that does. And there are many, many communities that have embraced this idea, who have built solid entrepreneurial ecosystems. And you know what, again, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to go somewhere else. Welcome to Innovate Fort Worth, the podcast where we highlight local innovation and the people bringing those innovations to market. I'm Cameron Cushman, and this episode is part of a new feature called The Big Picture, where we will interview various national leaders in innovation and entrepreneurship and discuss how they relate to Fort Worth. I'm excited to introduce today Peter De Silva, an accomplished business and finance leader and an advocate for entrepreneurs all across the country. He's a former CEO, president, national nonprofit leader, and former Harvard University senior fellow. But he's also the author of the book, Taking Stock, 10 Life and Leadership Principles from My Seat at the Table. But perhaps most notably, at least for our discussion today, he led Kansas City's Big Five initiative to make Kansas City America's most entrepreneurial city. Peter, welcome to Innovate Fort Worth. Cameron, thank you. It's so wonderful to be here in what was sunny Fort Worth yesterday, but a little hazy today. That's all right. It always seems to get cloudy when we record a podcast. I don't know why that is. Uh, okay, great. So I want, uh, I'd love for you to share a little bit of your background and, and you cover it in the book, but tell us a little bit about your background, your story, and how you found success in the financial and banking industry. Well, you know, I grew up back in Massachusetts, and when the time came to go to college, my parents said, you have three choices. You can go to UMass Dartmouth, UMass Dartmouth, or UMass Dartmouth. There you go. And you can live at home, and you can work 40 to 60 hours a week to put yourself through school. And that was the beginning of, of my professional career, if you will. So that's what I did. But when the time came to really think about what I wanted to do, it became evident to me that I was not going to be able to get what I wanted living in a small community in southeastern Massachusetts. So it was off to Boston. And I ended up at Fidelity Investments. And candidly, it was a very, very low level role. But through 17 years of hard work and innovation and creativity and risk taking, I moved around the country for them, I ended up in a pretty good place. And then one day the phone rang and someone said, why don't you move to Kansas City and run a bank? I said, because I know nothing about banking. Why would I do that? But in essence, somebody said, you know what? I think your leadership skills will trump the lack of the technical skills around banking. So it was off to Kansas City for 12 years to help build UMB Financial Corp into a wonderful, wonderful institution. And then the phone rang and Roger Reine, who owned Scott Trade at the time, said, don't you really want to get back into the trading and wealth management business? And don't you really want to live in St. Louis? I said, yes to one, no to the other. <laughs> but he convinced me that I, I should. And so it was off to St. Louis, and I was able to run Scott Trade until we sold that company. And it was off to TD Ameritrade at that point. And love TD Ameritrade. We built a phenomenal trading and investing platform, but we sold that company to Charles Schwab as well. So it's been an interesting journey. You know, I didn't start out in business and finance. Cannily, I was pre-med in college when I first started. So it maybe found me. And what I really realized over time is the intersection between my skill set, my leadership skills, really trumped the need for any technical knowledge. And I was able to take those skills and build a pretty good career out of it. And now you've written a book about leadership. So what led you to write a book about leadership? And, and can you kind of tell us a little bit about the book and, and some of the leadership principles that you share in the book? Sure. You know, I didn't set out to write a book, actually. So after the uh, TD Ameritrade time was done, after we sold the company to Charles Schwab, I actually had a two-year non-compete. And so I had this period of time, which I had never had for 30 plus years, this downtime, so to speak. And I had to decide what to do with that, that period of time. And so a friend of mine had said, you need to go to Harvard. And I'm like, no, I don't. They said, no, you really do. There's this wonderful program called the Advanced Leadership Initiative. And I looked into it and decided that was something I wanted to do. So it was off to Harvard for 18 months. And if you've ever been at Harvard, pretty much everybody's written a book, is writing a book, or will write a book somewhere in the future. And so I felt a little maybe a little bit of peer pressure. And I said, you know what? I've got a story to tell. 
Um, 35 years of life and leadership lessons, primarily in business, but candidly, I remember debating this with my editor because she's like, these are leadership lessons. And I said, they're both life and leadership lessons that I thought maybe I could tell this story. And it's a set of experiences. It's a set of things that have happened to me throughout, throughout time, some that I caused, some that I didn't. Um, and I thought maybe if I could codify these into a set of principles, that they might be useful to others to advance their learning and to accelerate their understanding of their own leadership and life journey. And so it was off to writing a book. I'd never done it before. I hadn't imagined I would. Um, and I hired an independent publisher to help me sort of organize my thoughts, codify the principles, and, uh, and get the book delivered. It took me 18 months uh, to, get that, to get that done. So the book does offer a set of life and leadership principles that I have found helped me be successful in both life and, and leadership. And I can highlight just a, just a few for you. Uh, one is about, about vision and the need to establish and create vision, whether that's for you, for your family, or for your organization. You'd be shocked how many organizations walk around aimlessly doing today what they did yesterday without any real sense of what the future is all about. And so every place I've been, the first question I always ask is, what is our mission, what is our purpose, and what is our vision? And by the way, today, young people in particular want to work with companies who have purpose, companies who you know, really understand that their mission is much broader than just making money. There's a social dimension to that. There's a business dimension to that, right? And so the first principle, and they're not any particular order, but a principle is to make sure that you establish this vision. And it reminds me of a story where one time there's this gentleman walking down the street and he's walking down the street and he sees, a, uh, sees another gentleman who's laying bricks. And he asks the gentleman, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm laying bricks. And he says, well, that's kind of obvious, but okay, thank you. And he walks a little further down the street and he asks the next gentleman, what are you doing? And he's laying bricks as well. And he says, well, I'm building a wall. I'm like, oh, okay, he's got a, this guy's got a little bit more sense of what he's actually doing, not just laying a brick, but creating a wall. And he walks to the third gentleman who's also laying bricks and he says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a cathedral. So who had the vision? Who really understood how their action, laying a brick, was contributing to the broader picture? Employees, associates, friends, family, everybody wants to know the big picture. So rule number one that I propose is to really think about establishing that vision, creating that vision, communicating that vision, and ensuring people subscribe to that vision. A second one that I'll, I'll spend just a minute on is uh, it, goes, um, it goes like this, my saying goes like this, if you take care of associates, they'll take care of clients and the rest will take care of itself, right? So focusing on your associates and creating an associate environment that is as good or maybe even better than your client environment is critically, critically important, right? I found this in my entire career. And when I was at the bank, we used to have one chart in the annual report every year that I liked the most. And it was this, it had three dimensions to it. It would show our progress on associate engagement, our progress on client engagement, and our progress on our business results, earnings, if you will, um, EPS. And guess what? Over a decade, those results were positively correlated. Every time we saw an increase in associate engagement, we saw an increase in client engagement, which led to an increase in our operating results. Pretty powerful indicator that if you take care of the associate, they'll take care of the client and the rest will take care of itself. And one more, maybe out of, out of the 10 I'll talk about, and that's really building lifelong relationships. The power of really having these lifelong relationships. I can't tell you how many times, just because I have did something for someone, or I went out of my way for someone, or I built a relationship with someone, that I'd get a phone call that might be beneficial to me. I mean, candidly, I'm sitting at Fidelity Investments having a good time, not thinking about going anywhere or doing anything different, and the phone rings, from someone at UMB Financial Corp who says, you know what, we've had a relationship for a long time, we've been watching you for a long time, what would you think about coming out to Kansas City and running our company? And that all happened because of a relationship that I had with the Kemper family. So those are three that I'll, I'll highlight for you. There are seven others in the book that hopefully folks will get a chance to read and uh, maybe they'll help, uh, help them think about their own life and leadership journey. Perfect. And the book's available on Amazon or wherever they get their books. Indeed. Amazon, pretty much anywhere, though, you can find it. Perfect. And you're here today in Fort Worth during Global Entrepreneurship Week. We're about to do an event in a little bit to uh, to kind of highlight the book uh, in person. So thank you for coming to Fort Worth. We're, we're uh, glad that you were here. 
So can you tell us a little bit about your experience in uh, leading the Big Five initiative in Kansas City? So maybe kind of tell us that whole story about how that came about and, and really what it led to and what some of the results have been over time. Kansas City is a wonderful American city. It was the first Western city in America in many respects. And people like to say that St. Louis is the last Eastern city and Kansas City is the first Western city. It had a very, has a very open sort of style about it. So here's a guy who shows up from Boston in 2004. And by 2008, I'm leading the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, that's how open that community really, really was to people who wanted to be involved, wanted to be engaged, and, and really wanted to, to make an impact on the lives of, of Kansas Cityans. Um, the Chamber of Commerce in Kansas City had this idea, which was, in, in retrospect, brilliant, which was for the business community to really own the economic development agenda. Now, you might argue most chambers try and do that. It wasn't happening there. But they thought, thought more broadly that not only did we need to own the economic development agenda, but we needed to create a comprehensive strategy for the community. And Kansas City is a complicated place. It's Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. There's rivers, there's counties, there's all these different divides. And we felt like if we could bring the community together and coalesce around five big ideas that were going to really stimulate the, the economy, that would be great. So. I've always believed entrepreneurship is the cornerstone of American free enterprise. And so as a consequence, I raised my hand and said, I think we need to focus on entrepreneurs. We have to create a much more effective entrepreneurial ecosystem in order for entrepreneurs to thrive in this, in this community. And folks said, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Why don't you lead the effort? And I said, no, that wasn't the idea. The idea was for me to propose <laughs> the idea and then have somebody else lead the now effort. Now you're stuck with it. Now I'm stuck with it. <laughs> And my first stop was actually over to see Carl Schramm at the uh, Kauffman Foundation. And if you're an entrepreneur, you should know the Kauffman Foundation. It is probably America's foremost organization ded dedicated to all things entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. So I went over to see Carl and I said, look, we have this idea that we want to make Kansas City a much more entrepreneurial community. What do we need to do? I was really seeking his advice. And one of the first things he said to me is, well, you have to declare that Kansas City already is America's most entrepreneurial city. And I said, Carl, I can't declare that because I can't defend that. And he said, it doesn't matter. You need to go out and declare it and create that vision and create that inspiration for people to get, to get behind you, to get enrolled in, this, in this, uh, this event. I was very nervous about it, very, very nervous about it because it's not my style to go make claims that I can't back up. But he said, you need to do it. And he said, if you do it, we'll help you. We'll, we'll get you resources, we'll give you dollars, we'll make sure that we put the full weight of the Kauffman Foundation behind the effort to make Kansas City America's most entrepreneurial city. And so I did it. Scared, but I did it. And I was shocked by the response in a positive way. People really felt like, wow, for once we have a vision, we're, we're staking a claim. It's something we know we're not there today, we, we can't really compete with Silicon Valley, we really can't compete with Boston and Austin at that juncture anyways. But there it was, on the stage, with two governors in attendance saying that we were going to be America's most entrepreneurial city. And it really galvanized support for the effort, along with the help of the Kauffman Foundation. Um, and I was really, really proud that this was 12, about 12 years ago. I was looking at the Chamber's website this week, and guess what? It's still there. Entrepreneurship is still one of the big five. So have we achieved the objective? Yeah, it's hard to say we're America's most entrepreneurial city by many empirical measures, although the measurements have improved immeasurably over the last decade or so. But it's a journey. It's a destination. But it all started with staking a claim and saying we are something we aspire to be and getting the community behind us. Well, it was a great vision. And, uh, and you're right. It turned into really a, a rallying cry for a lot, of the, a lot of folks in the city, of course, the entrepreneurial community. But what I loved about what you were able to do from your seat at the chamber was to pull the corporate community in and get the corporate engagement groups to care about entrepreneurship, right? They're too busy, worried about their bottom lines. Usually they don't think about the startup community. But what were some of the ways that you, as a representative of the chamber, was able to pull in some of these corporate CEOs and, uh, and leadership teams and, and get them to care essentially about innovation and entrepreneurship in Kansas City? Yeah, it was an interesting process. I think there were a couple different dimensions to it. Number one, having the chamber behind this, the institutional heft of the chamber was a big part of it. And so chambers are, are you know, they're member organizations and most of the big companies and many small companies in the community were members. And so when this came up, 
I basically went to the large, the large employers, the large businesses and said, you've got to get behind this. And not just with your money, you've got to be present, you've got to be seen, you've got to hire entrepreneurs, you've got to buy their products, you've got to help them build their ecosystem, et cetera. And it took a while, but they became to understand that in essence, the entrepreneurial community was supporting them in ways they didn't even appreciate whether it was hiring the local videographer or the local flower company or whatever it was, they were interacting with entrepreneurs all day long and they hadn't appreciated it, but they weren't necessarily doing enough for them. So step one was, I think having an institution with the kind of heft of the chamber behind us was really helpful. Going to the large and mid-sized companies and reminding them that they were already working with these entrepreneurs, they should do more. And that third, you know, companies like to buy other companies and quite honestly, a lot of them are small companies today that get to be mid-sized companies that ultimately become part of a larger organization. And so if you, can't, if you don't start them, and if we don't get serious about starting these companies, there won't be anything for you to roll up over a period of time. So there was lots of different reasons, but the thing that I was most proud of is the larger companies recognized that they had to invest in the ecosystem, not only for the economic health and vitality of the region and for the entrepreneurs themselves, but for the benefit of their own companies. And that was a that was a realization they definitely did not have prior to prior to the effort. Yeah, because it can absolutely help their bottom line, right? Just absolutely. having these groups to acquire. And startups are so nimble. They, uh, particularly in the tech world, they, they tend to help you see around a corner, like what are the trends that are coming? How do I not get disrupted as the big mm -hmm. old company uh, by bringing in some of these new young startups to help me kind of figure out where the industry's going and yeah. mentor them, fund them, invest in them, and maybe ultimately acquire them. It can be a Absolutely. really powerful appetite or a really powerful recipe for success. Yeah, I was so happy that the larger companies recognized that there are opportunities with local uh, local entrepreneurs. You know, they've been in the valley, they've gone, they've bought companies outside of Kansas City, and they always will. But they recognize that, you know what, there's something special about this place. There's something special about the culture. There's something special about supporting homegrown entrepreneurs. And, you know, there was also great collaboration with the university system. Uh, university of Missouri, Kansas City in particular was very, very helpful to us. Uh, one of their genius things they did was uh, sponsor a group called SourceLink. And if you're an entrepreneur and you haven't heard of SourceLink, you need to go, go look into it. Uh, Maria we Myers. We call ours Sparkyard here. So Sparkyard yes, we, in, we have it. We just Fort call Worth. it something different. Yes. Yeah, it's white label, but That's you right. stole it from Kansas City, <clears throat> basically, we did. We which, did. Is, which is great. Uh, there's a woman by the name of Maria Myers who you should go look up. She's she's really the architect and the genius behind what was Kansas City Source Link, which is now a global phenomenon. And uh, it's, it's all about supporting entrepreneurs to build that entrepreneurial ecosystem and communities all across America and across the globe are using that capability now. We're big Maria Myers fans here at the podcast. Indeed, as you should in, be. And in Fort Worth. <laughs> so is there any advice that you would have for the people who are trying to build their entrepreneurial ecosystem? What advice would you have for these sort of community leaders that keep raising this as an important topic and are working on various aspects of our entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Fort Worth? Yeah. Well, keep talking about it. Keep raising it. You know, make sure you've got or try and get support from your political leaders. Try to get support from your institutions of higher learning for sure. Um, we're sitting here today in an institution of higher learning, which is supporting and promoting entrepreneurship. Go talk to your you know, college administrators. Don't just worry about the business school dean. Go talk to the, the actual president of the institution and explain to them why having entrepreneurs in the community is going to build more economic vitality, which is going to build more innovation, which is going to create more brand for the, for the community and ultimately for the institution, you know, whether that's the university or whatever, whatever the case might be. Um, entrepreneurs are organic in many respects, right? I mean, they don't, sometimes they don't think about, oh, I'm gonna start a company, I'm gonna start something. It's, it's like, I have an idea, how does that idea germinate? Where do I go for help and support? And by the way, if your community, say Fort Worth, doesn't help me, I'm gonna go somewhere else that does. And there are many, many communities that have embraced this idea, who have built solid entrepreneurial ecosystems. And you know what, again, if you're not gonna do it, I'm gonna go somewhere else because ideas are fungible, right? I can take it anywhere. And you know, we've seen that. Kansas City used to suffer from uh, an issue where we'd get companies to a certain size, and then you know, somebody from the Valley would, would buy into it and say, you know what, I'm happy to invest in it, but you're moving to Silicon Valley. And because we didn't have talent or we didn't have board members or we didn't have financial support, et cetera, and many companies left. The question isn't 
whether these companies leave, the question is how do you force them, not force them, how do you require them to stay? How do you make it so positive that they wanna stay? And that's building a support network for them. And that includes funders, and that includes founders, and that includes board members, and that includes financing, and that includes the banking community being engaged in, in helping get these things off the ground. Um, so, so you have to build this very broad entrepreneurial ecosystem to keep those companies in your community. Love it. That's great advice. So, Peter, I want to shift gears a minute because I didn't know this about you. You and I have known each other a long time, but I didn't know this about you until I read the book. Uh, that you have uh, begun to share about your struggle with, and I'm sorry if I'm going to screw up the name here, it's Charcot Marie Tooth Disease. Mm -hmm. um, how has that affected your own life, and how have you overcome it for so many years? Yeah. So Charcot Marie Tooth Disease, or CMT, is a neurological disorder that affects about 3 million people around the world and call it 150,000 or so in the United States. We know those numbers are grossly understated um, in the sense that it's one, it's hard to diagnose, it gets confused with other uh, diseases. And if you think folks in China and India and Pakistan and North Korea are being properly diagnosed, you're crazy. So, so the numbers we know are much, much, much higher. Um, I was born with it. It is a genetic uh, disease that is a um, neuropathy that continues to waste away over time. And so very simply stated, you know, your nerves in your body are connected to your, your muscles in one form or another. If the nerves aren't functioning properly, then the muscles waste away. And that's what begins to happen with this disease. It manifests itself in many different ways. Uh, in many different people. It can be quite severe. Uh, my sister's been in a wheelchair for 25 years, um, probably my fate somewhere down the road. Um, and my nieces and nephews have this disease, although you know, to, varying, to varying degrees. So it, it is a very, very difficult thing. I found out about it when I was a, a young person. I knew I had it. Um, as a teenager, I was operated on many, many, many times. And my parents' answer to this uh, issue was, this is your problem, keep it quiet. Don't talk to anybody about it. Don't show any vulnerability. Show strength. And that was, that was I believed in that. I thought that that was the right, the right thing to do as well. That's why you didn't know about it, as you and I became friendly over the last decade or so. Well, you hit just, it well, so whatever you did, it worked. Just kept it quiet. That was their advice to me, and it was good advice. And to be honest, in the business community 20, 25 years ago, the idea of being vulnerable was not a good thing. Right, yeah. Right? You had to be strong. You had to be vibrant. You had to be... A leader had to be strong and vibrant. So I was nervous about talking about it. But as I got a little older, I began to realize that one, vulnerability can be a bit of a strength. People want to work with people who are authentic, who are genuine, <laughs> who are transparent to the extent they want to be and can be, are honest and open. So that was one reason I decided to write about it in the book. The other was there are no treatments and cures for this disease, not a single treatment right now that you can that you can find, and so I joined an organization called the CMT Research Foundation, whose only mission is to raise money to fund the best research that we can to try and fund uh, try to find um, treatments and cures. I'm happy to say that we've made a lot of progress in a short period of time. That the first real drug might actually enter human trials next year um, because of an investment we made in a small startup. Uh, believe it or not, it was a small startup entrepreneur out in San Diego who had an idea about how he would attack this disease. He's had a lot of success and he just sold this company for a billion dollars. Right? So, so we started it with him and he just sold it for a for billion dollars. So, you know, entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur in medicine, by the way, is something you guys are very focused on here at the university. And there's a lot of entrepreneurial activity in, in beyond biosciences and in medicine more broadly. So I decided it was time to get involved for a couple different reasons, including the fact that my daughter str struggles with this. And if I leave any legacy at all, I'd love to leave the legacy of finding a treatment or a cure for CMT. That makes a lot of sense. And you've really jumped in. You're trying to help raise money for this, uh, for the foundation. Yeah. But how can our listeners get involved and either learn more about the disease or potentially contribute and, and help this, you know, uh, there's research to find a cure and a treatment. Well, I appreciate the, the question. Go to cmtrf.org. Uh, we've got all the information if you're a patient. We've got lots of information. If you're just interested in this disease, go check us out. Uh, we'd love your financial support if you're so inclined to do that. There's certainly a donate button uh, on, uh, on the website. We are a 501c3, so it's all tax deductible. Um, and we'd love to have you as, uh, as one of our partners. 
Fantastic. Well, thanks for sharing that story with us and, and showing that vulnerability that, uh, you know, just because you have a debilitating disease doesn't mean you still can't have tremendous success in your career and write a book about leadership and lead a big five initiative and do all the things that you've been able to do in your career. So we're, we're grateful for, uh, for you sharing that with us, uh, particularly at a medical school, which we love. Uh, Peter, who is your favorite innovator? Well, it's an interesting question because if you look through history, there are some innovators like Benjamin Franklin, who was just an extraordinary innovator, right? He created the post office and the volunteer fire department and all kinds of things that people had never thought of to that point in history. Thomas Edison has to be on that list if you think about great, great innovators. But I'll stay more contemporary. And I'm looking over here at the shelf and there's a, the Walter Isaacson book by Steve Jobs. Hard to leave him off the list as, as one of the great innovators for, for sure. Um, you take a guy like Jeff Bezos, who had an idea about selling books, which morphed into Amazon, which morphed into web services, and is just a, you know, a giant of, a, of an organization today. So you could look at those gentlemen and, and say, you know, they're all incredible uh, entrepreneurs and innovators. But my favorite, and he's not everybody's favorite, is Elon Musk. I think history will judge him. You can say what you want about his politics or his style, whatever. We'll judge him as, as probably one of the greatest innovators of all, of all time. I don't know how he has enough brain capacity to think about rockets one minute and automobiles the next minute and boring tunnels the next minute and then this little thing called uh, X or Twitter that he's trying to turn around at this juncture. He's, a, he's an incredible human being, obviously. He's been able to really innovate his way to success and I think he'll continue to do that. When he says Occupy Mars, he's like not kidding. He's not kidding. He thinks, you know, that we, should, we can and should do that as a, as, a, as a global society. So he's the kind of guy that, you know, a lot of people like to poo-poo for various reasons. I don't. I have tremendous respect for him, tremendous admiration for him. And I think he will leave the world a better place. Or leave the world in, in general. Who knows? Well, um, anything's possible. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting, though. You know, his the mission statement for SpaceX is to colonize Mars. Yeah. It's not go to space, build rockets, serve the International Space Station, whatever. The goal for the, the vision for the company, you talked yeah. about vision, is yeah. we want to colonize Mars. So what a crazy vision yeah. that everybody's trying to live up to day in and day out yeah. that uh, is goes way beyond just what they do uh, building rockets and launching things into space. So, yeah, he's indeed. a great choice, no doubt about it. And now he's, now he's a Texan, so of all the things. He's a good man. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much for joining me today on Innovate Fort Worth. Uh, if you want to learn more about Peter, you can visit his website, and I assume buy your book, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. At PeterJDeSilva.com. That's PeterJDeSilva.com. And on that site, you can also find more information about his book, Taking Stock, 10 Life Leadership Lessons from My Seat at the Table. Again, that's PeterJDeSilva.com. And if you want to learn more about the CMT Foundation, you can visit their website at cmtrf.org. That's cmtrf.org. If you like learning about innovation in Fort Worth, please subscribe to Innovate Fort Worth and be sure to leave us a review. If you wanna join the conversation, follow us on social media at HSC Next. Today's episode was produced by Kendall Rogers. Jamie Barnhart is our digital editor, and our technical producer is Rob Upchurch from Rob Makes Pods Productions. Innovate Fort Worth is brought to you by HSC Next, a department of the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth, where we are driven to improve the human condition through a passion for innovation and teamwork. Thank you to PNC Bank for supporting innovation and entrepreneurship in Fort Worth.